All right, is everyone good? Well, welcome to um, the afternoon session of Faith at Work. Right, this panel, which is 2A, is the Relationships at Work panel. Right, so you know, it's a cliche. People say relationships are everything. Right, and then we also know that if we invest in relationships well, there is really very good spin-offs, right, in the workplace and how things can be. And we know that people who are good at relationships sometimes are not very good at work, but they get very far at work because they're just very good at relationships. And then there are other people who are very, very, very hardworking, but are terrible at relationships. So in the end, they just don't get anywhere. But the point is this, is that relationships are just very important. And I think as Christians, because we are defined, right, by that word love for agape, the word relationship becomes even more important for all of us, right? So today we have a panel of um, four people over here, right? On my far right is Aaron, eh, no, 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 Jimmy. <laughs> as moderator, cannot this kind of thing, right? Then next to him is Julian, right? And then Aaron and Cheryl. So what I'm going to do, right, is that I'm going to get them to do a quick introduction based on these four questions. Now, each of you have under one minute, right, to answer this question. Right, so Cheryl, you're lucky because you're next to me. So we'll start off with Jimmy. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hello, afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say that you guys have been very great uh, audience and participants, and uh, thanks for being here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Jimmy. I'm currently in the Singapore Prison Service, and um, I direct the corporate communications and relations section in, in the Singapore Prison Service. And I've been a prison officer for almost two decades. Right. Uh, what, what was I doing before this? Uh, this is my first and only job uh, for the past 21 years. Okay. Um, what do I do most of my time now? You know what happens when you, you cross uh, 45, you're a bit worried about your health. So moving towards 50, so I spend a lot of my time uh, uh, engaging in physical activities, exercise a lot, and also spend a lot of my time with my family as well. So, um, okay, one thing I learned, uh, like about what I'm currently doing is really very different because uh, as a prison officer in my entire career, it is a rare opportunity for you to get to do cop comms, mm -hmm. deal with the media, do branding, do social media, you name it, pretty interesting. So I really enjoy my past five years in Copcoms. Um, what I don't really like about, not really hate, but a bit disappointed because I joined the prison service to, to work with prisoners and help to make a difference in their lives. So I spent a good half of my career working in a prison, running a prison, working together with prison officers on the ground. I really enjoyed those days and I've kind of missed it. Hi, so my name is Julian. Uh, I'm a doctor. I treat patients with arthritis and I have worked, uh, I graduated in 1988. Don't tell me when you were born, okay? <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, uh, um, and uh, so I worked in the uh, Tan Tok Seng Hospital, uh, the National University Hospital. I was in academia for a while and uh, in SGH for 12 years now. Uh, what did I do before, before this, before becoming a doctor? Yeah, well, uh, oh, a student, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is my own. Yeah. Sorry, I think I misunderstood the question. Okay. And besi besides work, what do you spend most of your time on these days? Well, um, our group, the group, uh, medical group that we were chatting just now, um, don't have much extra time. So uh, I spend whatever little time I have with my family and I, I'd like to exercise. Yeah, uh, I think uh, pushing, pushing 50, you know, health becomes more important and I need to lead by example. I tell my patients to lose weight, so I have to lose weight too, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what, what's one thing I love about my job and one thing I dislike about my current job? Well, it's, it's satisfying. Uh, treating patients is always uh, fun when they get well. Um, the, the thing that's really challenging is that the healthcare system is changing and there are lots of challenges we're facing now in systems and structures that we've not faced before because of an aging population. So no, I spend a fair bit of time trying to be involved in trying to sort that out. So I, I, I love it, but it's very, very challenging. So much prayer, I appreciate it, because if we don't fix this, all of us are going to be in trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron. Uh, what I do with a living, I um, am a regulatory and ethics lawyer at a bank. Uh, in my current role, I've been here about five years. Uh, I work for a German shipping bank. Uh, just before this, um, hmm, I was also working in a bank. Yeah, so I, I've been working for about 17 years, 
mainly in the area of um, uh, banking finance. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What do I spend my most of my time other than work? Yeah. Um, okay. I probably two areas. Uh, one is uh, um, uh, I'm into the arts. Um, yeah. So I'm married to a, an artist, a painter, and a dancer. I also write uh, poetry. Um, so uh, one of the areas that I things that I do after work is um, to spend time uh, with other artists and also making art and enjoying art. What's one thing I love? And okay, so the firm that I work with is a Singapore branch of a rather large um, uh, European shipping bank, uh, but the Singapore office is only about 50 people. And uh, so one thing I like is that it's a small enough firm that I have a personal relationship with uh, people. In uh, I like that. Uh, and one, what do I hate about my current job? Okay, I think because of my work, which has to do with you know uh, compliance and uh, um, doing the right thing, um, yeah, it's a bit difficult for people to kind of uh, to approach them because uh, they often feel, oh, this guy is going to come and uh, tell me what I'm doing wrong or he's here to catch me for <laughs> for something that I'm not doing right. Yeah, so that's a struggle for me. Hi, I'm uh, Cheryl. So I'm the youngest and smallest fry in this panel. <laughs> okay, what do I do for a living? I, uh, I'm a relationship manager at Citibank. Uh, and I've been with them for the last 10 years, and it's my first job. So I've never seen any other pasture outside of city. Um, and before that, I was uh, studying. Uh, besides work, I spend a lot of time with uh, family. And I think uh, I also spend a lot of time with uh, church friends. Yeah, I think these, these two. Lah. Okay, one thing I love. Um, okay, because I'm a relationship manager, I, I spend my entire day talking to people, which uh, I guess I like to talk. Lah, you know, so so I, I, I love uh, engaging in conversation with people and, and making relationships. Uh, and, and hopefully because uh, I've been doing this for some time, I've formed some close relationships with certain uh, clients and uh, I, I like that because I feel that then the relationship becomes deeper. Uh, what I hate about my current job is all the rules and regulations in the banking industry right now. <laughs> yeah, so I totally understand where Aaron comes from. Yeah, all the bankers will not really like him so much. <laughs> yeah, but really, honestly, I feel that the banking industry is going in such a direction where it's becoming so regulated, really crazy regulations and. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's making me wonder like how much longer I can stay in this industry because I, I try to do my job as best as I can, but then it's quite overwhelming now, yeah. All right, thank you. Now, just in case you can't remember their names, right? Some people are like me, right? So <laughs> this is them, right? So there's Jimmy, um, Julian, Aaron, and Cheryl, right? So what they're doing, after us doing Q&A, I will flash this up again, just in case you're like me, right, with poor memory. Okay, so how we're going to do this, and actually we're a bit tight in time, right, is that I split the portion after this into five segments. So now is the panel. After that, you will have a short time of reflection. Then there'll be Q&A, and then you'll reflect again, right, and then we'll end off the whole thing. Right, so for this segment, I'm going to have four main topics. For each topic is directed to one um, panelists, right? So after the panelist answers that question, the other panelists can just hop in, right? And you got any questions, any comments, and stuff like that, then we can take it from there. Okay, so without further ado, right, I'll just move on, right, to my first question, right? And this question is to Jimmy. Right, so somewhere, well, some time ago, I read, right, about this grad school professor who gave his student the following advice just before she was about to launch her career. And this is what he said. He said, don't get too close to your co-workers, he said. You never know when you're going to have to fire someone and you don't want to fire your close friends. Let me repeat that again. He said, don't get too close to your co-workers. You never know when you're going to have to fire someone and you don't want to fire your close friends. Now, the questions which I have for Jimmy, and there's quite a few questions. First question is just, what are your thoughts right, on that statement? The second question is this. Jesus tells us to love our neighbor. Can we speak of loving our fellow workers, subordinates, and bosses at the same time? 
and at the same time point to maintaining a certain boundary in the relationships for the sake of efficiency and effectiveness in working together and getting things done? That's my second question. Right? My third question right, is, how have you been managing this relationships during your career as an employer, um, fellow colleague and boss? Right? And were there situations where you had to pursue a difficult course of action with a person in the workplace whom you had a good relationship with. I hope you're not lost, right? But Jimmy, as he answers, I think he will bring us through, right? So the first thing we're talking about is love and boundaries. You get a mic working. Thanks for the question, James. Pretty tough questions. Yeah, uh, took a while for me to actually reflect on the questions, but I'll, I'll try my best. Um, when I, when I firstly, when I look at the quote, the, the first thing that came to my mind was, what was that quote focusing on? And, and, and as I read the quote, quote a bit uh, 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 deeper, and I realized that the focus is on really maintaining a relationship, a line between yourself and a co-worker. And, and what, what's the motivation between that assumption? And uh, in my own opinion, that assumption is that I need to protect myself, right? Very much from, I need to maintain that line so that I can do my job well, if not, something bad will happen, so therefore, I need to protect myself. So I thought that was the focus. And, and, and my immediate thought is that that shouldn't be the focus. And I thought the, the right focus should be how should we behave in such a way that is according to Christian principles and how can we love our co-workers as a leader, as a peer, and even as a subordinate who truly cares. I thought that should be our focus when we deal with our co-workers. And, and I think if that is our focus, I think how I would interpret it as that, therefore, we need to be very authentic in, in where we are. Sorry. Very authentic in terms of our relationship with our co-workers in the sense that our behaviours must be very consistent with Christian principles. We need to be very caring. We need to be very professional. And when I mention being professional, there is this uh, perception that you cannot be caring if you are professional. Right? But actually, that's not the case. You can be both professional and caring at the same time. You can even set very high standards, very professional, and yet being caring at the same time. So, so these are some of my thoughts when I look at these quotes. And... And based on my personal experience, uh, being working with people for many years, I think it is absolutely fine if you, are, you have a very good relationship with your co-workers. I think it's very important. And, um, but what is more important is on a daily basis, how you show up, how you behave, and how you interact them on a daily basis. And that makes a big difference. And if your behavior on a daily basis is consistent with Christian principles and Christian teachings, I think you're fine. And I think what's more important is, I think we, I'm, I'm speaking from a leadership perspective, all right? If you are in a leadership role and you've uh, given an opportunity to lead a group of people, I think what we should do as leaders is really we need to lead like Jesus, being a servant leader, all right? And I think um, a servant leader means that you need to be a servant first before you become a leader. Being a servant leader meaning that when you lead a group of people, you are there to serve them, you are there to serve their growth, their development, and make sure that they become better than you are. So if you put yourself in a servant leadership perspective, I think things will turn out very differently. Compared to a person who is leader first. And when a person is leader first, you are very focused on power, command, control. And that acts up in certain behaviours that I think will affect the way you interact with your co-workers. So these are some of my thoughts. And, and I was looking at organisations in uh, current context and organisations in the future because I'm pretty interested in studying organisation. And if you look at how organisation evolves today, and for the future, you want to really have very effective organisations you need people who are very enrolled. You need people who are very energized, filled with passion and commitment. And, and they will go that extra mile 
to really do what it is required for the organization. And in order to do that, how each person in, within the organization relate to each other plays a critical role. I think being a relational organization will have, definitely have an edge over organization we are very hierarchical. So these are some of my thoughts. And, and that, the, the, the other questions are pretty interesting as well. Were there situations where you had to pursue a difficult course of action with a person in the workplace whom you have a good relationship with and, and how did I manage it? When I look at the question, I, I'm asking myself, um, I try to recall some of those incidents that happened and I ask myself, what was I focusing on internally and externally? So two things came to my mind. Internally, as a, as a manager, as a leader, when I, uh, I deal with my co-workers whom I have very good relationship with, and when I, ha I have to face a situation where I have to um, either share a poor performance grading, um, uh, so-called provide certain feedback that is not so uh, positive, deep down inside, internally, my focus has been always the same. Firstly is that my focus always is always on organizational interest above my self-interest. You know, being a leader, you're placed there for a certain reason, right? You're there to forward the organization purpose. So internally, my focus needs to be very clear. I'm here to forward organization purpose, and whatever I'm going to do follows, the organization purpose must come first. That is internally as a manager. Externally, I think the focus is important as well, and this focus is not something that you do now and then, but it is something that you've been doing consistently. Your external focus is how you show up, how you relate to the people all this while. But the point here is, when the people you work with know who you are, they know that you truly care on a daily basis, and you can relate to them very positively, when a time comes for you to share bad news, when a time comes for you to be very professional about what you need to do, my experience is they tend to swallow it better because they know that you are not being personal because all this while you have been caring and being a, a very good supervisor and today I sit you down in front of me and I'm going to share with you your poor performance grading. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you that C. I'm going to give you a D. More, most often than not, I realize that the people I work with, they don't take offense, they don't take it personal and they know, oh, Jimmy must have been given a very tough job. He needs to share this bad news with me. Because all this while, Jimmy is the type of person that they know and they really know who you are. I think that makes a difference. So, but having said that, I think I need to caution that uh, you need to be very careful. You need to do your job very professionally because the moment that you show favoritism or you show that um, you are not able to do that task given to you very professionally, it's a matter of time that the people around the organization will see it. And as a leader, your credibility will go down the drain. I think that that's key. And I think we, we cannot accept that. And um, last but not least, I think um, when you do such thing, especially giving bad news or poor performance grading as a leader, you need to do it very professionally and try to, to frame it in such a way as within work constraint. You don't bring up other aspects of, of your relationship into the discussion. Keep it professional. I think how you do it, it helps. Uh, let me give you an example uh, with regards to my relationship with my boss. My boss is the Deputy Commissioner of Prison, direct. I report to Deputy Commissioner of Prison and Commissioner of Prison. But I work a bit more with the Deputy Commissioner of Prison. Um, our relationship is very good. Um, we, we have a very close relationship. We lunch together. At times, I was telling James, on Saturday morning, we cycle together with a group of other friends. And we laugh, we talk, anything under the sky, you know? But when it comes to work, I know that he's very professional, you know? And there are times that he will, he will reprimand me when, when things go wrong. And, and I'll say, oh, shucks. I feel quite bad about it, of course. But never a time when I felt that he, he is, is, that relationship is affected, you know? I had such a good relationship with you. Why are you saying this to me? How can you do that? Never. Because, because to me, all this world has been very fair. He treat all of his staff very nicely, and we knew that he had a job to do, and he does it very professionally. So I think that is an, an example that I can share um, uh, personally that how my boss relate to me 
and somehow I'm affected by that, and that's how I work with my, my staff as well. So, um, maybe to close this very quickly, I just want to share um, my perspective on how we should relate to our co-workers. I think both from a subordinate, a peer, and even at a leadership perspective. I think, number one, I think we need to get to know our co-workers well. Uh, I think relational in an organization is, is the way to go. But in order to do that, you need to invest and put in effort. You know, to build a relationship doesn't happen overnight, no. You need to put in a lot of effort to really build that relationship. Get to know your co-workers beyond that job title. Get to know your co-workers as a person, as an individual. Every one of them have a very unique story to share. And if you know that story, you will see that person in a whole very different light. And, and from my personal experience, if you do this really well, more often than not, um, from a leadership perspective, you are more efficient and effective. Things get done very quickly. Things can be done by a phone call and sometimes a very simple sentence and your, your co-workers know what is expected. And they go that extra mile you know, for you. So not really for you, but for the organization. And that helps a lot. And, um, and last but not least, if you have very good relationship, especially with your boss, um, one important point, never use that relationship for your own self-serving purpose. I think that is very important. You know, very often people think that you have very good relationship, especially with your boss, right? I'm in a special position, you know? I'm able to really uh, use it to forward my own uh, personal agenda, and, and then that is the biggest mistake you can ever make because our bosses are intelligent people. Uh, you can only pretend for so long. You know, so never use it to forward your own self-purpose, but use it to help the organization forward its vision and mission. And I find it very useful if you can use it to help other people to do their job even better. And I do that all the time. I think that is pretty important. And um, last but not least, um, with regards to relationship, I find it very useful to have uh, role models. Uh, sometimes uh, at work, even when I was a subordinate, at a peer level or even at a leadership level, I do encounter a lot of uh, relational issues. How should I relate with my colleagues and my peers? And I find very often talking to someone that is a role model for me helps a lot. So, and, and this person will often um, guide me, give me advice. So this role model can be someone you respect a lot within the organization, uh, your church elders, your cell group, and even your uh, church pastors, and, and they have value added quite a lot along the, along the way. Yeah, that's what I want to share. Right, no one has anything to say. Right, um, we're running a bit tight on time, but before that, can the AV people, I think all these mics are not working. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so next question which I have, which is to Julian. Right, this is how it goes, right? So I have two friends. Right, so I basically have one friend, and this is very recent. Um, he's been unfairly used by his bosses, basically to fulfill some organizational objectives. And it's not just for a short while, it's over a period of five to six years already. Right, and so he eventually found himself in a very unfavorable position, um, inadequate compensation and so on. And recently they're laying off basically nearly the entire company right now with very poor um, reasons for it. Then I have another friend um, who's DD or deputy director, who is quite an influential person. Um, so this lady goes around on a daily basis, um, speaking to everyone within the team, basically influencing them to rebel and sabotage the director. So she come to my friend, look at him, talk to him, and you know, give him the knowing look, waiting for him to respond. And it's very tough because he just sometimes don't know what to say. Right? Do you want to say or do you not want to say? Because both choices has you know something behind it after that. So the question is really this, and we're talking about politics, right? So as Christians, right, um, and this is to Julian, what should we do and how should we respond when we are drawn into office or organizational politics, right? And another question is, are there actually instances where it's okay to play the game, right, to play the game of politics for the greater good? And how can we protect ourselves in such situations, right? Also for Julian and I always thought that if you're somewhere at the top of the medical hierarchy, confirm a lot of politics one. So please share with us 
an experience. No, 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 he's not political. Right? I'm just saying very political there. Right? Please share that's an experience you had and the various considerations you had in responding to and managing the political situation. And perhaps just a word of advice right, to those who are going through this now. Okay, so, um, yeah, I guess we all uh, tech, uh, have to deal with office politics. And um, I think the Bible helps us a lot. I, I find that uh, the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah had dealt with a lot of politics at an organizational national level. Uh, Daniel, and the Lord Jesus uh, was attacked and had to deal with politics all the time, you know, and you go and look at the, how Jesus responded in the Gospels, much wisdom across from our Lord we can learn there, and also from Daniel and Ahimaya uh, in particular in, in the Bible. So, uh, those of us who are following Word Life, a couple, of, maybe a month ago, uh, it was the readings for Nehemiah, that was really very insightful for me. So, uh, always back to scriptures. So, I'd like to start from the end and just share a personal experience and then a few thoughts, if I may, and answer some of those questions. So, um, almost 20 years ago, uh, I was in an unpleasant office situation. There were the two most senior colleagues in my department couldn't get along. One of them was my mentor. It was awkward for several reasons because uh, it became very clear eventually that uh, the, the department they, they, had, they couldn't go on like that. Like someone had to, you know, there had to be some change. And the organization was savvy enough to realize this. So they called us younger guys. 20 years ago, I was young, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Still young, still young, but I was younger, okay. To the, uh, and they asked us for our opinions, and that made us, a few of us felt even worse. You know, you're asking me for my opinions about people I respect, and my mentor, no? <laughs> you know, okay. Uh, and uh, I really feel, felt very uncomfortable because I respected their strengths, but it was, I was also painfully aware of areas where they were not strong. And many of us wished if you could only get along, uh, it'd be such a strong department. You know, if only they could talk to each other, you know, we wouldn't have all this, we could spend a lot of our energy doing the right stuff rather than trying to stay alive, you know? You, you know what I mean, right? You know, there's a lot of wasted effort in the office. And eventually, one of the senior colleagues, my mentor, left, and it was not a very pleasant thing, okay? And those um, people who are unfortunately kind of linked with that person also gradually faded away, including myself. Uh, and uh, I, I think I left because really the direction at that time was really quite out of sync with what I wanted to do. So I, I, when we talk about uh, this, though, I would just say that uh, I took real pains to keep on good terms with uh, people there. So in fact, we're still on good terms, and we basically agreed to disagree. Uh, so this happened a long, long time ago. Uh, and as I was reflecting on this, um, I think this really did shape my thinking about uh, uh, working in politics, because when I became a boss, I told myself, I promised myself, myself I'm never going to let uh, my colleagues have to go through what I went through. You know, it was just no fun. Okay. So um, a few thoughts that I may like to sh just share. One is that um, perhaps if the chance arises and you're stuck, and someone asks you to say something, uh, say something positive about the person rather than something negative. You know, even if you've got grounds to say something negative, you can always find something nice to say. Right? Uh, no one can fault you for saying something nice. Okay? Um, and it really doesn't help to say something bad about the person. And very often it makes things worse because the other person, people begin to suspect the other guy uh, and suspect you as well. You know, how come you as a Christian are saying bad things about somebody? You know, the Bible tells us that we let our speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so we know how to respond to each person. So you can put it differently. For example, there's somebody who's really uh, very, very bright, but not a team player, right? So I can say, hey, he's just not a team player. Or I can say, you know, his strength lies in individual-focused work. He's really good when he does stuff on his own, okay? <laughs> Saying the same thing, but in a different way, right? Okay, <laughs> right? So put people in the good light if you can. And secondly, if you need to take a stand, uh, you can, uh, I would suggest you could sit, consider doing it on principles rather than personalities. So in other words, uh, if someone is picking on another person and I'm in a position to stop it, I say, you know, it's really not so fair to pick on one person. Uh, rather, and that's a principle, right? Rather than say, I don't like the way you're talking about this other guy, then it becomes quite personal. Um, I think it's important for our testimony that we're seen to act from Christian values rather than from uh, favoritism or personal bias. So ju just share a story about this. Um, uh, one of my colleagues came out to me some years ago and said, uh, you know, uh, because we have to handle patient care, teaching, research, uh, and education. And he loves to teach. And uh, we were, there's a real push for research at that time. So he told me, Julian, you know, if anybody asks you for anything for research, they will get it. If I ask you for anything for education, I'm almost certain you'll say no. And initially, I was quite upset. But as I went back and thought about it, actually, he was right. He, he was right. And I, I had to go back and thank him for telling me this. Uh, and I used the opportunity there to try to avoid the being seen to be biased, uh, because I told the whole department, you know, he was right, I made a mistake, and let's try and fix this. Uh, the whole department at the time, I'll show you a photo at the end of it, there's time, but about 10 of my senior colleagues who were there, yeah, and there were about 30, 40 people there. 
Um, another th- suggestion to respond with grace, I think it shows the love and gentleness of God. So don't really act in anger. Some minor offense, you can overlook it. Give the person the benefit of the doubt, which is quite hard when you're angry and you're biased. Yeah? So really have to work at that. And apologize when you made a mistake. Uh, one other thing that I've seen people do is to go the extra mile to, in this sort of office politics situation to show they've been gracious uh, and not vindictive. So for example, when that story I told you at the beginning, when I had to uh, leave, um, uh, I, uh, I was asked to stay on for another four months because of a staff shortage. So my notice period was half a year, which if you've ever been in a situation, was quite awkward. Uh, because you're not, people, everyone knows you're leaving. You know? So they had a planning retreat. I, was, I didn't go. No point, right? Because I'm leaving. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it was, quite, it was quite awkward, but it really helped to maintain good relationships. My, my new employer agreed to that. And uh, so I, I think that really helped because the, to this day, I'm still on pretty good terms with the, the people in that place which I left. And, uh, um, yeah, we see each other on a regular basis, actually, at meetings and stuff. Okay, so is it ever right to play politics for the greater good? I think that's one of the questions that James asked. Uh, a different way of stating this, maybe in a more generalizable way, generalizable way is uh, does the end justify the means? So does the greater good, which is the end, justify the means, which is playing politics? Okay, so does the end, which is the greater good, justify the means, which is playing politics? So I may want to help a colleague to get what I th- a promotion which I think he deserves, and so I will play politics to help him to get it. Uh, just to frame it now. So I, by saying that, I think we know from the Bible that God has made the world that we reap what we sow. Right? Galatians chapter 6 tells us that. And so my own suggestion is it's really not right to play politics even if this leads to a quote-unquote greater good. Because I think honestly, God doesn't really need, need our help to achieve His purposes. Uh, I think He's perfectly capable of doing that and I think our job is to move in step with His Spirit. Uh, a last thought, if I may, is that uh, God is interested in your office uh, God is uh, he's Lord over your office and He wants His grace and love to be manifest there and He wants all of us to be channels of His grace and love. Abraham Neiper, who is a Dutch theologian, uh, you should read his life story. He was a pastor. He started a newspaper. He became Prime Minister of Holland okay, because of his convictions. Yeah, pastor. And I, I think uh, he, he said, he, his book, uh, Lectures on Calvinism, he has a statement that's quite well known. He says, uh, there's no single inch of the whole world over which the Lord Jesus Christ does not say, mine. There's no single inch of the world over which the Lord Jesus Christ does not say, mine. So Jesus is Lord of all, including our work and our offices, and He wants to be glorified there. That's been a real encouragement to me in office politics, uh, that there can be a better way. And if you've ever worked in an environment, many of us were over there, and we talked about our bosses, right? So if some, some of us have had the experience of working in a pleasant working environment, and you really know how how much fun it can be, right? And how people really want to come and work there and, you know, they enjoy it. You go to the office in the morning and uh, you're, uh, you're kind of quite excited to be there because like, you know that it may be tough, but you've got good friends to work with. So I think that's the kind of thing we like to move towards as Christians. Yeah, just a few thoughts. Any, any thoughts from the other panelists? Yeah. Just share some quick points. Um, with regards to politics, don't gossip or bad mouth. I think, um, to me, those two activities are early signs of politics. So once you're involved in gossip or bad-mouthing, you are, those are early signs that likely you will get into uh, office politics. And I think one thing that helped personally is, for me is that I try to limit my association with people who engage in gossip and slander. And then for very practical reasons, number one, if you, you, you're not with them most of the time, you're not influenced by them, that's one. And we're not with them, you don't listen to their gossip so that you don't gossip because you don't know what they are talking about. So, so avoid associating with them, I think that's pretty important. But what I observe that um, people who are involved in actively in o- uh, office politics are those who are pretty ambitious and they are very concerned with their career and progression. And, and if they are very concerned with their career and progression, very likely they'll be involved and actively involved in politics for their survival or forwarding their own agenda. So one tip for us personally as Christians is sometimes uh, we notice that we're engaging in certain activities like maybe a very simple gossip or passing certain comments. The first thing um, I find useful for me to do is really ask myself, what are some of my uh, desires and intentions internally? Am am I uh, going for something or am I concerned about my progression or promotion? I think that search from within, I think that's important. 
right. Okay, thank you. We'll just move on quickly to the next question. Right, this is to Aaron. Ephesians 6, 5 to 8, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you will obey Christ. Right, and then it says, um, Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes are on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, and so on and so forth. Right, so the question is this right there, you know, as a subordinate in the workplace, the biblical ideal, right, I think, in handling our bosses is one of obedience with an eye towards pleasing God. However, I think Paul did not have in mind perfect bosses when he wrote this. And how it plays out is definitely not black and white, right, either. Right, so the question is this, right, and this is about the difficult boss. Right, what principles, Aaron, guides your relationships with your bosses across your career? Now, when I spoke to Aaron, it sounded like he had a tough time, right, over the last few jobs. So, right then, what course of action do you adopt when your boss gets difficult? And are there times when disobedience is the right thing to do? Right, and please share some experience of yours. Well, I've, I've been working for uh, 17 years. In that time, I have had five different roles, uh, both uh, with other organizations as well as within the same organization, doing different things, reporting to different people. Um, I must say that uh, when I, I've been a Jesus follower for many years, 30 years uh, or 31 years, uh, I did not have a mentor uh, when I transitioned from being a student to the working life. And so I had to bumble my way through um, the early years of my career. And uh, I must say that uh, I made many mistakes. Um, I did not give my career over to the Lord, even though I said I did. You know, the first few times when I changed jobs and so on, it was for reasons such as I want more pay, because I see that my other lawyer friends, you know, my age have been making a lot more money than myself, or I wanted more responsibilities, or uh, even on one occasion, I was fleeing a very difficult boss. So, um, and, and you know, research does show, and I think your own experience may, may bear this out, that most of the time when people leave a job, it's not because they leave the organization, they're actually leaving a boss. Uh, and uh, of course, in Singapore context, so it's not that common that we can say we want another boss. You know, like, oh, uh, I want to stay in organization, but can I change bosses to change teams? It's not something so common. So we suffer in silence, we agonize, we cry, and. Uh, uh, and then uh, we, when we feel that we cannot take it anymore, we put in the letter and we go. Uh, one of my principles which I have sort of come to a somewhat late understanding of is, is this, that uh, your place of work and my place of work is our primary arena for sanctification as followers of Jesus. Uh, the pastor Eugene Peterson did say, he contends that really there's no more important place for God to do what he wants to do in our lives than in the place where you go and you report and you do work uh, and you pl apply yourself nine to five or nine to nine, five, six, seven days a week. And one of the most important lessons I felt that God was teaching me throughout this time that I've been working is this, he wanted to once and for all decisively put an end in my heart to a fear of man, what man can do to me and what man can do for me. And, and, and so, uh, this is the first thing. And, and he wanted me to exchange my ambitions and my expectations for a dynamic and a fulfilling role, uh, 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 my, my own ambitions and, and career expectations. He wanted to exchange this for something better, something better which is a, a very dynamic sense of calling that I am doing God's work wherever I may be. Um, and that involves stewarding relationships, both with my peers, with my bosses uh, and my associates and subordinates, and stewarding my talents for the good of the organization and for society. So that's the first thing that I find that God wants to do. And if where you are now in your job, you still feel that you have this fear uh, uh, about what your company can do to you, what your boss can do to you, 
uh, you can be sure that this is something that the Lord wants you to rise to this challenge and work it through and overcome. Um, so that's the, the, the first kind of uh, a thing that I've been learning. The second thing that I've been learning really is, is this, that um, it wasn't until relatively late or mid middle through my career that I came to really see and accept that God is my employer. I know I have been, I have given lip service to this idea of oh, God is my boss, God is my boss. Uh, but when I searched my heart, you know, I, I realized actually that was not the case. And circumstances in the office conspired, and this was God's hand at work, to teach me this lesson. Do I really see God as my boss? If he is my boss, then he there are several practical implications, one of which is this. He has made himself responsible for my livelihood and for my welfare and that of my family. Not my boss, not my team leader, not the guy on the board, not the who I know on the, in the organization, but God himself. Uh, and one corollary of this realization is this, that he then also has the full freedom and flexibility to deploy me where he likes in any season of my time and uh, how he pleases. So God has the freedom to move me from where I am now to somewhere else. And so I think in the last couple of years, um, I, I, I've, I've, not, I've sort of let go of this idea that, oh, this place where I'm in here, this is going to be my promised land and then I'm going to stay here, and it's going to be career advancement is great, and I'm going to basically retire here. I've, I've done away with that, um, with that idea. I, I, I just see that, okay, God has an assignment for me. I don't know how long it's going to be. It's going to be here, and uh, uh, it may be uh, for a season, maybe even just to merely minister to one person, uh, you know, and when that assignment is done, if I've been faithful and obedient to it, to know it and to do it, then God has every right to move me somewhere else. This job that I, I, had, I have right now, I joined it uh, uh, in a rather interesting way. I, I was working in a private bank. Uh, this private bank does not exist anymore. It was a branch of a Swiss bank. Uh, and I joined a new team of compliance officers uh, who, and over time, we kind of realized that uh, there was a group of customers in this bank who were actually in jail overseas, and yet somehow controlling hundreds of millions of dollars across 30 or 40 accounts. And every now and then they would move the money here, and they're giving the flimsiest of excuses that they were doing this and doing that. You know. And this group of customers was so important to the bank that no one dared to ask too many questions. If you ask a question or two, you would get slapped down straight away. Uh, so over the course of time that I was there, which was a few, six months exactly, me, my boss, and uh, my colleagues, all were quite new, you know, uh, uh, less than a, a year there. Uh, we had to figure out what to do with it. And uh, when we escalated it to management and even to head office, at first we were given some, like, you know, uh, kind of sayang, sayang answer. Okay, you do whatever you like, you write, write your papers and uh, whatever, and then, you know, just carry on. Uh, but the moment we began to say things like, no, this is uh, quite suspicious, we may need to report this to the authorities and so on and so forth, um, then the response came back quite harshly. And essentially, my boss was called to Switzerland. He flew 12 hours there for a two-hour meeting in which he was told by the boss, um, these customers have been here before you join. They will no doubt be here after you leave. Do you really want to jeopardize your career uh, here by making a fuss about it? So uh, he came back, passed that message on to the team. And uh, by that time, uh, head office had already sent someone to come to the office and spy on us. On the, on the, on the fault flimsy uh, excuse that uh, we're here to help you. But actually, he didn't help us do anything. He, he said, you are so busy, you know, so uh, no, actually he didn't. He just basically sat there, eavesdropping on all our meetings. Whenever we had a meeting, he would come invite himself. And then uh, uh, every afternoon, as soon as uh, Europe opened, he would make a phone call to Zurich and speak in his Swiss German. And we all couldn't understand and report on what we were doing. So uh, things got really quite bad, and, and um, uh, uh, but after this meeting my boss had, he came back, he resigned. I resigned the very next day, and my other colleague resigned one week later. Uh, we left as a group, as a matter of principle. We all left without another job. 
Um, this was the first time in, in, the, uh, in my life that I've actually left one job without another job. And uh, at that time, I was already married. Uh, I have dependents. My parents are retired, and uh, my wife is an uh, um, uh, independently employed um, artist. Uh, her parents are retired, so um, there was a lot of pressure somehow. Uh, um, and um, but uh, we, I did it as a matter of principle. I must say that I was so blessed to have had the support of fellow Christians in the organization, with whom I had started praying weekly over lunch. Uh, so that was also one area of accountability. Fellow Christians were, were able to help encourage each other, and. And then I became uncomfortable to them. I, I don't dare anymore to say, uh, uh, no, no, let's, let's leave it alone and back off. Yeah, um, so, um, yeah, so that's just one story. And, and actually, this became part of my CV because when I applied for the next job, uh, they interviewed me several times. And then the last interview, my big boss asked me in front of all the interviewing panels, says, Aaron, I know you've told me before why you left your last job without another job. Tell me again. And I repeated the story concisely. And then he said, this is why I want you. You are the man that we want. Uh, so so it, was, um, it became part of my testimony that when I joined this place, I had the credibility that I would always choose doing the right thing over doing the expedient thing. Uh, and uh, it strengthened my relationships with the bosses who know that uh, they can trust me to give them plain, unvarnished advice. Um, uh, and um, and that I wouldn't sort of uh, be flexible with the rules or anything like that. So yeah, that's just one little uh, testimony that I have about that. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on quickly to the next part, but before that, just have one last question for Cheryl, right? And um, that's how it goes, right? So basically, after talking to her, she went through a rather tough time at work previously. Um, in her earlier part of her career due to certain disagreements. So I just want you to share with us very briefly, right, the situation, right, and the key issues and the challenges which were involved in this whole tough situation. Um, the main thing is, you know, this, this thing is about whoops, adversity and perseverance. So the question is more of how do you respond? What kept you going? And how did things pan out eventually? And maybe a word of advice to any of those over here who are going through something like that. Um, okay, so mm, what happens is that, um, okay, so as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, I have been with City for 10 years. And uh, during the 10 years, I've had many different, I've been under many different bosses. Uh, some are really good, some are very challenging. Um, so I will share the ones, the, the one that was particularly challenging, which made me almost want to leave uh, um, the industry altogether. I didn't even want to be in banking anymore after, after that. Lah. Um, okay, so basically, uh, as a wealth manager, I uh, manage a portfolio of clients. And uh, normally we are given, or at least in, in my group, we are given quite a bit of autonomy as to how to... Uh, manage the portfolio. So these are all rich people, right? And then you want to try and manage their, their wealth for them. Normally, it means that you will need to um, sell them products like uh, stocks, bonds, uh, mutual funds, insurance. That's mainly my bread and butter products, which we all uh, have to do. Um, and so uh, I have always been the sort of person who is a little bit frank, maybe too frank. Uh, Maybe in my younger years, I was very tactless, um, but I've, I've always been very open, uh, and uh, I, I make friends very easily, uh, but I guess I also am too easy with whatever comes out of my mouth, and a lot of times I say things, and then I'm like, oh, I can't pull it back anymore, oops. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's me, uh, just a bit of background. Um, okay, so what happened was that, um, you know, when I uh, moved into this new department, uh, I, I had a new target, which was much higher, a sales target that was much higher than it was before. And then I needed to hit that target, right, to prove myself because I just joined this new team. Um, and the boss that I was uh, under at that point of time um, was a very good salesperson. Um, the boss was very good uh, at what she did, um, and she expected that her team would all be top performers as well. Um, so, you know, 
I am, uh, I'm the sort of person that really wants to excel at, at the things that are given to me. So uh, it was also uh, partly trying to prove myself and prove my worth to this new team. Um, okay, so in essence, uh, my performance was not that good because on one hand, I want to prove myself. On the other hand, I, I struggle with my Christian ideals. And the ideals are that I don't want to sell products which are not right for the client. I don't want to do things that are not right. I don't want to do unnecessary things like... Because every product or every deal that I do earns me money, right? So it can be very easy to be in this industry and then just do deal after deal after deal after deal and I'm earning I'm like ching, ching, ching in my own bank, right? But it may not necessarily be the best thing for the client. Um, so one day, uh, this boss of mine uh, realized that my performance was not that great and I think she was disappointed. Uh, so she sat me down and she started asking me like, you know, why are you not selling this particular product? Uh, and the product that she wanted me to sell was a product that I did not believe in. Um, I felt that the payoff to the client was not, not good lah. Okay, so <laughs> I why would I sell it? I I so um, I guess in my naive, in, in, I, I was quite naive at that time, and also I had very strong ideals at that time, and so I just told her straight that I don't think, uh, I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it, and she said, uh, "Are you saying that the bank makes?" bad products and we are selling bad products to our clients and I realized I had caught myself in a very bad situation because it's like oh I don't quite know what to say after that so it's no not really I mean I'm trying to say I don't quite believe in it I feel the payoff blah, blah, blah. okay anyway I, uh, I I messed up okay so after after that convers that one crucial conversation with this boss subsequently after that I felt that things really went downhill. Um, it was very difficult for me because uh, I was trying to stand up for what I thought I believed in, you know? Uh, I wanted to stand up for my, for my values. Uh, but then, uh, because I am pushed to hit a certain number, uh, hit a certain target, and my boss is here pressurizing me and breathing down my neck and asking me why I cannot, like, uh, do this, then, um, uh, and also because I think I was too opinionated in my response and I didn't really like measure my words properly. It came across like I was uh, challenging her authority um, and uh, she also sold a lot of this product. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you know, <laughs> I'm saying that she's... Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, so, um, so after that, it was super downhill from there. Uh, uh, I think I won't go into the details, but uh, suffice to say, uh, uh, in the first place, I was quite new to the team, and, and this happened quite early on in my that new team that I was uh, put in. So it became very bad because uh, she's also very, uh, uh, she's an aggressive salesperson, and she's also very good at turning people against you, or how to, how to put it, like, um, uh, Basically, it ended up as the whole team ostracized me, and I was all alone, and I felt very lonely. Um, and so during that time, um, I, uh, uh, I guess how I responded to it, or how, what, what kept me going was, uh, I went back, I prayed a lot with my husband, I prayed a lot with my family, with my parents, um, who encouraged me to continue to do what I felt was right, uh, who encouraged me to uh, do my work with integrity. Um, and uh, it, I think the situation went on for about, uh, I think in total maybe about uh, one and a half to two years, where I was not liked, I was ostracized. It was quite tough because, uh, as I was sharing with Aaron earlier, I am someone that I, I need people to like me. <laughs> So when people don't like me and I just don't want to talk to, it's very terrible, you know. And then, so I, I really like re became so um, different from the actual. My actual character is I'm outgoing, but I became like totally opposite. Like I was very quiet. I just did my own work. I just put my head down. I just tried my best, and um, I, I told God that God, you know, um, you are my boss. I don't care about anybody else. I just do my job well, and I hope that I can stick this out as as long as possible. And then I got pregnant. <laughs> 
and I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to leave after <laughs> I give birth. Um, and it was, I, I, I now on hindsight realized that it was, I was, I was running away. I was finding excuses, trying to run away from, from this disastrous situation that I was in. Um, in the end, how things panned out was that uh, uh, I had decided already that I was going to tender my resignation after uh, my four months of maternity leave. So I enjoy my paid maternity leave, and then I come in and go, here you go, I don't work for you anymore. Um, but as it turns out, just as I was coming right from maternity, I found out that the boss decided to leave. Um, yeah, so, mm, so now what I want to say uh, as, as a word of advice to my brothers and sisters who may be going through this uh, is what I have learned is that um, uh, as the topic goes, <laughs> persevere. <laughs> um, but I, I, think, uh, I think in times like this, it's really good to have a community that you can turn to. Uh, if, it is, if it is not in the workplace itself, it can always be in your own church or just uh, friends that, that you can trust. Um, what kept me going is that within the, the, the team, I, I was sort of ostracized, but yet there was a few people that I could trust and talk to, and I think that did help. Uh, that I had like maybe one ally. Uh, the other thing was uh, is also that uh, um, mm, I I learned to depend a lot more on um, on what the Lord has in store for me. Um, and also, it was funny because uh, when I was thinking about tendering my resignation, all the doors were closed. I tended, I, I, I mean, I uh, tried to apply for other jobs, but there was nothing available. So I, I was actually very angry with God. Like, God, you know that I'm in this very yucky situation, and yet you don't want to give me a way out. It's almost like I can't even escape. And I, I could not live without, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I do need the, the income, so, um, because we were about to have a baby also, right? So I cannot just like drop and then leave it to my husband. Yeah, that's very irresponsible. So. Um, yeah, so I felt like I had no way out at all. But as it turns out, uh, like uh, when I was discussing with Aaron earlier, he, he, he said to me that it seems like God did work it out for me in the end. Um, yeah, and uh, on hindsight, I guess one thing I want to share is that uh, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, how to deal with co-workers or, or the relationships or how close are you with your, your co-workers. And... and and we said that, you know, uh, I think it's always good to be approachable and to be open and to be friendly and to invest in the friendships, like, seriously, like, deeply, not just, like, high by type, you know, because I think that, like you say, you know, the workplace is a place which you really spend a lot of time. It will be very fruitless if you just, you know, go through life, or go through your work life, not really making any true, good and deep friendships. Um, but uh, a word of caution, I guess, is... Um, if you are someone like me who tends to be maybe too open and then too frank, I have learned over the years to be a little bit more tactful, to, to, to think about what I say before I say them. And if I were to go into that meeting again with that, uh, with that boss again and, and she would ask me the same question, I don't, think I, would have, I don't think I will now say in that way anymore, which is that I don't believe in the product. But it would be more like um, uh, uh, maybe that product is not suitable for this particular client, right? Right, right. Yeah, so, so I think I've learned over the years that, you know, at the workplace, yes, you can be very real as a person. You can be very friendly. You can be very uh, honest. But, uh, and, and, of course, do your work with integrity. But um, think carefully or strategically about how you, how you, the things that you want to say has to be thought through before you say them. I think that's important. And I'm still learning it. Um, I wouldn't say I'm good at it yet, but um, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot more about how to handle myself and also the way I approach other people and particularly bosses and how to manage the bosses or talk to the bosses. Yeah, I think I've, I've learned a bit more about that since then. Great. Right, we'll spend the next maybe three to five minutes Right, just discuss this. Right, then after that, we'll have a Q&A session. 
Alright, so just take this opportunity to just talk to each other, suss out some questions and things like this. Right, then after that, right, you can ask the panelists, right, um, whatever questions you have. Right, so these are the questions. What stood up for you? What do you struggle to understand? And what would you like to clarify and or find out more about? I only have a mic, right? So I, I know this morning you guys SMS your number and stuff like that. Right, so if you have any question, right, and I trust that you have, right, just do me a favor, just tell us your name, okay, and then just let us know who you want to direct the question to. Right, the names are there, Jimmy, Julian, Aaron, and Cheryl. Right, and then we'll just take it from there. Okay, so now the table is open, right, the floor is open. If there's anyone who has a question, just raise a hand. Right, and then one of the um, ushers, sorry, one of the helpers will pass the mic to you. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Esther. I'm from WEFC. So um, my question maybe to Cheryl. Um, okay, so I'm 22 this year, and I'm working in uh, Copcoms. And one of my greatest challenges is that my, my company has gone through um, a merger of four companies in two years, and also that there was no communications department before, and now we are suddenly here. And so the engineers are not happy that we are telling them, like, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, it's coming from headquarters, and plus, like, my age. So I'm 22, and the engineers are like 50. They've been, the, they've been in a company for 20 years, and nobody wants to listen. I mean, they don't even listen to my boss, la, so they won't listen to me either. So in this situation, like, what kind of advice would you give? Oh. <laughs> wow. Well, I... I'm not very experienced either, you know. I don't know whether the experience, the... Comms director. Okay, how about we ask the comms guy to answer first? <laughs> okay, I don't have the exact answers, but I have similar situation. Maybe I share my story. Okay, um, just a couple of months ago, we, we went through an internal comms audit of, of the entire organization and, and found gaps. So um, our organization is organized in such a way that, similar to yours, we have different units and divisions. So through this internal comms audit, we found that there are a lot of gaps, you know, and, and a lot of things need to be done. So when my team presented this to me, the first thing I look at the, the proposal, I say, wow, if I'm the engineers, for example, or the head of this branch, I say, oh gosh, the comms is giving me more work to do. I think it's a very similar situation, right? I'm very busy here already, you know? And you're, give, you're going through this, don't know what internal comms audit, and you give me the whole list of things, alama, more work to do. So, so that was my immediate reaction. I, I thought it would be similar to how your engineers are reacting, that I'm really busy enough with all this merger and all that, and now comms is coming over to tell me there are more things I need to do. My plate is really full. So, so my, my guidance to the team is that let's look at the data and, and what we should do is really share this data with the respective division with the intention that, hey, we, we did this internal comms audit and these are some of the data I gathered from your division. We would like to share it with you. We'll just share it with the data. And, and, and that's all we did, you know, very interestingly. And um, after a while, they came back to us and said, hey, this data is very interesting. We realized that there are certain communication gaps and, and we discussed internally that if these cats are plucked, how it would help our division to make it better. The, the funny thing is that we did not tell them what to do. We just shared with them what we found out in terms of data. And we just say that uh, we are there to help if you need any. And we just shared the data with them and let them interpret it. And they came back to us to find out that these are the things we realized. And we may want to tweak things like this here and there. Can you help us? You know? That's how we actually started to really come into the picture to assist them. So, so my point here is that um, all of us, we have different areas of responsibility. But when it comes to um, going to areas of other people, we need to be very sensitive that they also have a lot of work to do. How to position it in such a way that I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to share with you some information and I'm there to help you. And if you need my help, um, uh, we are, we'll be there. And it's important for them to own that piece of work as well. I don't know how, how to, to help you with regards, but my point here is that you need to get them to realize that this piece of work is important, they own it, and if they, they do it, 
uh, there's something to gain for them. Rather than Copcom's coming in, I'm telling you this, I found out, and you got to do this. I don't know whether it helped, but this is how we approach that situation. I think the reason why it was, uh, was directed at me is because I guess uh, you are young and I'm young. And it's a, a young person trying to deal with a much older person. Um, I, I, I definitely think it's a very tough situation to be in. Um, and uh, what I would like to say is that, uh, yes, you may be young, but you are in this particular um, segment for a reason, right? You are good at what you do. And I always feel that, um, uh, say for example, you are in corp, corp comms, right? You're good at what you do, and I think you should project how professional you are so as to um, let these 50-year-old engineers not really think so much about how young you are, your youth, but that you are professional, you know what's best for the company, you all come together as a, you, you have a, a proposal that is uh, uh, solid, and then you uh, push the idea forward in uh, a tactful way. And I think it, it does help that if your group works together as a team, uh, it's easier than to try and have like one person talk to the engineers, another person talk to the engineers. If you all can come up with a solid proposal together as a group, and then it may not look as daunting when you uh, make the proposal to the engineers. I, I, hope, I hope that helps. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question right in front here? I would like to pose this question to Julian. Uh, earlier on, you mentioned about like when people um, are engaged in gossip and they try to include it in it, uh, to go back to the principles rather than uh, personal, to make it personal. So actually, um, could you elaborate on that, how um, we can just uh, speak to their principle rather than to make it personal? Yeah, um, I think Jimmy's point is very helpful. Um, if you can stay away from the gossip, just stay away. Um, if you're having lunch, you know, and this thing comes up, change the conversation, mm. or steer it in a positive direction. I would suggest. Um, uh, you'd be surprised how much influence we have on our peers, right? And uh, if there are five people having lunch and two people are negative, and three, you know, one person can quite quite quickly see if you see something that would. Um, not uh, put, not not add fuel to the fire, but douse it by saying something nice about the person, uh, it, the person being gossiped about, or point out something that he or she has done well. It can actually help to uh, diffuse the situation. One, if you have to stand up and say, "I think that's, um, I think that's wrong," you know what? So this, this person gossips about so and so, right? Says, "Oh, you know, this guy cheated," and you say, "I know for a fact that's not true." Okay. Uh, when you, want to, when you have to do that, then the way to do it is to do it from a principle as opposed to, I think he didn't uh, do it wrong. I know he didn't do it wrong. You should probably say, he didn't do it wrong because he followed this and this and that, which is the principle. Does that make sense? Um, then early on, you mentioned, um, I think we shouldn't talk about it when the person is not around to defend himself. Did you say something like that? Uh, I, yeah. I didn't, but I think that's oh. a good principle if you can, oh. uh, if you can apply it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, maybe God spoke that to your heart. But it is a good principle. Very, very oh. often, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh. Then I realized that like, if, let's say, we choose to uh, be different from others, like yeah. choosing not to engage in gossip, very often we become, we become an easy target for gossip as well. <laughs> <laughs> then oh, what do we can, how can we diffuse that situation? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I can just share a few thoughts, but my colleagues probably have more experience, uh, as, as a different experience. I, I would suggest that um, we be known for, we, we should be, as Christians, be known for positive things. Uh, we should not be defined by thou shalt not. Uh, we should be defined by a better way. Right? That we are more gracious, loving, hardworking, because we know the Lord and the Holy Spirit is in us. Okay, so uh, I hope that, that that indirectly answers your question, uh, that people can gossip all they want, but uh, if we really are working hard, if we really are doing our best, acting with integrity and honour, I think the gossip will eventually die. La. Although it can be quite painful, you know, when you're the brunt of gossip. I think that happens to all of us. I mean, for myself, even now, you know, uh, it's just part of life, but how we handle it, I think, is important and much, much prayer. La. I hope that uh, at least partly answers your question. Maybe my colleague. Yeah. 
I think um, that part, I think, what are you focusing on is very important. I think um, be aware of your emotions and be mindful of how you're reacting to that gossip. Mm -hmm. And if you're focusing on that hurt, I think that will be very painful. But I thought it'd be good if you can focus on uh, and find strength on how you can forgive as opposed to being hurt. I think if you're able to focus on being able to forgive those goss people gossiping behind you, I think that makes a world of difference in how you respond to them. And, and, and in terms of if you focus on forgiveness, and you also must also have this trust that God is in control. And, and I, I can quote Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. So may God bless them. You know, may God have mercy on them. So what you can do is really um, pray and seek God's guidance if you are victims of sub go such go gossip, protection. Talk to your role models, your cell group, your church leaders, and continue to do your best. Because if gossip, there's no truth, right? As Julian mentioned, it's just a matter of time and people will know that the, the gossip doesn't really hold. So, so just pray and seek for guidance. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, anyone else have a question? Uh, hi, just a question to any one of you up there. Um, I mean, Christians, being Christians at workplace, we should be helpful and, you know, having good conduct, etc. So when it comes to work scope, especially when someone wants to uh, sort of push their work to you, how do you actually respond? Because if you keep on saying yes, then you might be burned out. So then how to be helpful yet drawing that boundary in a nice way? Yeah. Anyone? That's a good question. Uh, and uh, I must say it probably happens um, quite often in workplaces, uh, especially in, you know, with the current trend where companies are downsizing, people have to take responsibility for more work, for the same pay, you know, work harder. And um, yeah, and so it's led to several things which we can observe in many companies. There is one dynamic called turf guarding. There's another dynamic called cover backside. You know, <laughs> so some of these things uh, which we've all experienced, uh, you know, uh, and, and um, I would really say on a practical level, uh, it's good that if you see that this is happening uh, and uh, uh, that um, you deal with it transparently, uh, in a friendly way, and helpfully. Uh, I think one of the best testimonies that a Christian can do in the uh, company, uh, in a workplace, is to go out of your way to help other people. Um, but, of course, you also know that you have primary responsibility for the area of work which is given to you, and that you have to really play ball and, um, and uh, do that well. Uh, otherwise, you will not be able to be of any help to that person. So one thing you could do is this, you know, uh, you could, uh, if a peer comes to you and asks you to have, have work together, you could uh, say yes, you know, uh, but to make it transparent to the boss. So involve the boss as well. So the boss knows that, yeah, okay, uh, he's asked me to help him just for this assignment uh, and uh, I'm willing to do so, well, you know, and the boss knows. So then the boss is the one who's be able to see your work, his work, uh, and you are, after all, accountable to, to the boss. So that's one way. La. A private exchange like that, uh, you know, and we know that people have a habit of you know, leeching onto you and being a parasite. And after a while, you're right, you would probably just burn out and uh, uh, kind of uh, be really quite ineffective in your, in your own area of responsibility. Okay, maybe we'll take maybe another two or three more questions. Anyone got anything to ask? Hi, uh, this is to any one of you. So what if in the workplace you have a fellow Christian colleague who might have told uh, a non-Christian colleague some things that you think are biblically inaccurate, then what will you do? Will you go and uh, try to correct um, the misconception that the non-Christian colleague has? Because when, when you actually try to go and correct, then what kind of uh, impression are you giving to uh, Non-Christians, uh, If I happen to know that Christian colleague who gave that incorrect interpretation, um, I probably try to have a nice, quiet chat with that Christian colleague. First of all, I may be wrong; <laughs> he may be right. <laughs> I may, I may be the one who is not biblical, right? Uh, 
and then if, if uh, we come to a consensus and that colleague uh, feels that he needs to perhaps uh, revise his position, then it better if he or she is the one who tells the non-Christian colleague. You know, uh, be respectful of that, that person. Uh, yeah, that's what I would suggest. Um, I, I think in the workplace, you will find that there are, you will, f you will meet many different Christians from many different um, what do you call it? denominations, yes. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and um, actually, I have had this experience before. Um, but you know, I think over time, I realized that I must not always assume that what I believe in is the right one. You know, uh, I'm not saying that what, what you think is wrong, but you must also ask yourself, as in, is there a reason why you feel that it is biblically incorrect? Uh, and, and not be so close-minded. I, I, I come from a brethren background, so we, we pride ourselves by being very Bible-based. But then at the same time, um, I, I've had the opportunity to um, worship in other churches also, including charismatic and Pentecostal churches. And because of that, I have come to the realization that uh, God cannot really be boxed. And so uh, um, uh, I guess um, when you go to the workplace and you see that there are many different Christians from many different churches, I, I would prefer that we as Christians don't um, attack each other because we all worship the same God. Uh, I would prefer if actually I'm closer to that non-Christian friend, then uh, uh, I, in, in that situation, I probably may not correct it if I thought that it was a wrong theology. I would probably just spend more time with that non-Christian and uh, so subtly uh, let that person know my stand on things, but it may not be on that same day at that same time. So... Um, uh, I, I think uh, because you have you spend a lot of time at work, you, it's not going to be just that critical one day where you have to tell that person whatever, you know. It can be over, you know. It, sometimes you can take some time and uh, maybe the next week you say, hey, come, let's go out for lunch and then you talk about it and you talk about it in a not so, uh, not, not aggressive way, la, you know. And maybe you can bring up the a same, a similar topic and talk about it and say what you think is your view. Because that non-Christian also has his or her own brain, right? They can decide whether they feel, oh, this one sounds more sound, or this one sounds more sound. Um, as opposed to directly opposing the other Christian, I feel that's always not the right way to go. Lah. Yeah. It's very, very quick. I wholeheartedly affirm what uh, Cheryl has shared, that uh, relationship building is a matter of, takes a lot of time and uh, effort. Uh, so it's not one conversation that will change people's mind about you, whether it's a right perception or a wrong perception. Uh, and uh, that's the reason why healthy relationships in the office are important. We should constantly be striving to have healthy, uh, transparent relationships uh, and make every effort to, 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 uh, to foster those. There's a pastor that I respect greatly, uh, D.L. Moody, who actually said this, take care of your character and God will take care of your reputation. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, when we uh, concentrate on taking care of our character, our conduct in the office, where people see us, it won't take them two weeks before they make up their mind about you already, right? Because they see you so often. Yeah, and it's a very tough assignment. Uh, and uh, I know I myself of often uh, fail. Um, uh, but uh, I, I have this saying in a, in a, um, a little stone uh, uh, ornament which I put on my desk. And I also do, do think that uh, if we say what we mean and we mean what we say, that's a good rule of thumb. And the other additional thing I'd like to throw on top of that is don't say it mean. So don't say it mean. So say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. We have to transcend the culture of the office. If the cu culture of the office is one that is full of gossiping and all that, we need to transcend it. Not necessarily fight it all the time but transcend it in our own personal conduct. Uh, uh, so that at some point, you know, if someone gossips about you or backstab about you, the person who knows you well and all that, who is being spoken uh, about, uh, about you, uh, the person will say, no, I don't think that uh, Aaron is like that. 
I've known that person, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it kind of takes investment uh, in relationships. I think that's important. Sorry, I think very slowly. So I'm actually, I actually want to respond to the question about gossiping. <laughs> because we were talking about gossiping and um, I wanted to say that, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in my difficult situation, there were people that gossiped about, about me and said bad things about me, uh, especially when I was away on maternity leave and I, and I had no way to uh, defend myself. Um, but what I wanted to say is that if you persevere through this tough situation where you feel that people are ostracizing you, um, I, I think uh, very, very rightly what Aaron said is that um, God does protect your reputation. And, and I, I believe that. And, and your reputation is built over time. It, it's not, um, okay, of course, yes, it, within the first two minutes, people already make a first impression about you. And, and I, I know that because I'm in an industry where uh, the client makes a first impression about you within the first two minutes of meeting you or talking to you. So I know that first impressions are important. And m while you might have screwed it up at the first part, you, you still have you know, uh, the rest of your time at work to rectify or, uh, or make things better. And, and also, um, so, so what I want to say is that uh, uh, time will tell. Uh, and people who are there to see will realize actually what kind of person you truly are. If you maintain your integrity and if you maintain uh, um, uh, your, your honesty uh, and your honestness or your openness or your approachability, over time people will see that hey, actually this person is really not as bad as they thought. And, um, and I believe that God will also work in your favor. Okay, um, we're really running short of time. I have just one very last thing, okay, and final question to, sorry. Oh, one more. We only got five minutes. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, um, uh, this question it relates with the topic of evangelism at the workplace because I think a lot about what we had uh, spoken of is really how do we live a life of integrity uh, that confesses that faith, but how about verbally confessing that faith? Um, and I'm just wondering from your years of experience, um, and, and I think I'm also uh, seeing it from the perspective of my own bosses because some of them are very strong Christians. Um, and on one hand, I think it's, it's great how um, they are such positive influences through their lifestyle. But, so this is actually part two of the question now, because this is where I, f I feel it's also a little bit challenging. But other, b other colleagues who are not believers, right, sometimes see it as, oh, well, he is, you know, like using his position uh, as a leader to influence others for Christ. Or, I mean, they don't say it that way, but they think like, you know, they, they have not so positive impressions. So I think my two, my part A, part B, right, part A is, um, how, how do you think about uh, confessing uh, and, 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 and speaking the faith at the workplace, you know, and what, what are your views around that? You know, do you think it's something that we should strive, to, uh, actively seek opportunities to do at the workplace or is something that we wait for God to give us the opportunity? And secondly, um, how do you deal with that kind of, uh, with, with challenges that arise when you try to do that? Yeah. Maybe you get one person to respond to this. Silver servants easy to target. <laughs> well, I think you're right. I think uh, to a certain extent, um, non-Christians are really put off by Christians who talk about their faith, especially for Christians who talk about their faith, but when they see how they behave, it's totally opposite. I think that, that, that will do the, the worst damage. But, but I guess, especially in, in secular organizations like the civil service, for example, I think we need to be very adaptable. I think it is important to, to let your, for me at least, my team knows that I'm a Christian. But, uh, but I think we need to be very adaptable and very, how we say, strategic to a certain extent. Because uh, being adaptable doesn't mean we compromise our faith, right? But just being smart. And I think uh, and when we want to influence the people uh, indirectly, it has to happen at the intrapersonal level, meaning the change and the, the, the feelings and the reaction might happen within the individual. So, so how we go about doing it, or rather how I go about doing this, number one, I, I, my, my team knows that I'm a Christian. I think Pete this morning shared as well, he's, he's very open about being a Christian, but how he goes about 
uh, sending very subtle signals to the team uh, about his faith is important. You know, it can be a very casual conversation about how well, you, your weekend and I spend my time in church. And when we have meals together uh, uh, with my colleagues, and they see they, they can actually observe me saying grace before I eat, and and and, and for, uh, being thankful. So these are the little things that they know that you are a Christian. But I think what I want to share is that the influence of a church is through its spirituality. But the influence at the workplace is really it's about the success. So one way for me in, in a secular organization to really influence people about, hey, uh, uh, how come Christians is, is a bit different the way they work and the way they behave? Firstly, your behavior must be consistent with Christian teaching. But I think you need to work really very hard to be very successful at what you do and make them curious whether this success that you're in right now has got to do with your faith. I, I don't know whether you, 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 you understand what I'm trying to share. Uh, because people may not be very influenced about, wow, oh, you're a Christian, therefore, you know, you're but no. But you're very successful in what you do, the way you relate to people, the way you go about doing your work and all that. Make them curious whether it has got that something to do with your faith. But as far as the workplace is concerned, um, for me at least, um, the, the team, the people knows that I'm Christians and there are certain values and behavior I uh, exhibit on a daily basis. I think that's important. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question, but the rest can maybe just add on. Okay. <laughs> All right, I have uh, one last question and we don't have much time, right? But I want to direct this to Julian, right? And um, <laughs> since he prepared something for it as well, right? <coughs> the question is very simple. One minute. Please tell us what type of a legacy you want to leave behind in your workplace. Yeah, uh, okay, so it looks like I was the only one who sent in slides, so I got error. Anyway, okay. Sure. Maybe you want to just, um, I, I just like to, sh I stepped down his head after eight years, so this is uh, my, uh, my department photo from last year. I hope you can see these are my colleagues from all. I'm very proud of a really great bunch of people to work with. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, I, I wrestle with this issue of leaving a legacy. Uh, and James asked, so I sent the slides in, so I guess I get to uh, <laughs> round out the session. But I found this quote very helpful from John Maxwell, How to Leave a Legacy. Uh, I hope you can see it. He says, achievement comes to someone uh, when he's able to do great things for himself. Success comes when he empowers his followers to do great things with him. Uh, significance comes when he develops leaders to do great things for him. And you know, many of us try and do that to extend... Uh, our capacity, our bandwidth, right? But l a legacy here, a legacy is created only when a person puts his organization into the position to do great things without him. So you want to leave a legacy uh, when things flourish, when you're not around, then you've left a legacy. So um, there's this really lovely quote that I came across a few months ago. Live, he lived to be forgotten. Uh, this is said of this guy called D.E. Host. D.E. Host, uh, anybody knows who he is? Okay, so he really succeeded in living to be forgotten. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I <laughs> yeah, and I'm not joking because he was one of the Cambridge Seven. Those of us who have read a little bit about missions history, these are the guys, you know, uh, who went out. Uh, the E-Host was one of the Cambridge Seven, created a huge wave in, in the UK at the turn of the, the 20th century because they quit fame and glory and went out to serve as missionaries. He was an artillery officer, Cambridge graduate. He succeeded Hudson Taylor as the general director of the China Inland Mission, the CIM, just at the time of the Boxer Rebellion. That was a time when uh, it was a political thing, but uh, many Christians were martyred, Chinese Christians and uh, missionaries. Nah. Okay, so here was a man uh, who led uh, people through a really challenging time. And uh, OMF is flourishing today. Uh, and he put in place a legacy that it carried on through a 30-year period and then beyond that, without him. So that was a real challenge for me. Nah. So uh, he lived to be forgotten. So um, just, just the thought about leaving a legacy. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, it's 4.25. I think I need to release all of you. Okay, these are closing reflections, but never mind. Um, shall, we, shall we give a round of applause right, to all our panelists? Okay, so if you want to spend time reflecting, these are questions for you. Otherwise, I'll hand over the time to the MC.